In this program, we're going to deal with three environmental threats. We'll begin with polychlorinated biphenyls, better known as PCBs. We'll also talk about acid rain, global warming, and the destruction of the ozone layer will be the topic of our last report. We can no longer ignore the SOS signals the planet is sending us. A new toxic substance is found in our environment every month. Hardly surprising, really, society manufactures a thousand new chemicals every year. Most of them are launched on the market without their potential danger being assessed. Today, almost 35,000 synthetic substances that are potentially carcinogenic are used regularly. and garbage. A lot of it goes directly into sewer systems without pre-processing of any kind. And the remainder is buried in landfills carelessly. Toxic waste seeps into the ground and invades the underground waters. Via the food chain, it accumulates in living organisms. 10 years ago, polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, were banned. But we are not rid of them yet and we certainly haven't finished talking about them. In 1929, when polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, appeared on the market, the scientists had created one of the most stable and versatile families of molecules ever. Since then, these molecules have found their way into all sorts of everyday products, such as adhesives, paints, varnishes, inks, lubricants. Before long, their electric and heat insulating properties were put to good use in electric transformers and heavy machinery oils. Fifty years later, their manufacture and importation were banned in North America. PCBs are extremely stable. They do not dissolve in water and resist oxidation. They are not biodegradable and they accumulate in living organisms. When PCBs are spewed into the environment, they infiltrate the food chain and all living systems through skin contact, ingestion, or breathing. Once inside a living organism, the polychlorinated biphenyl molecules amass in the fatty tissues. Scientists have demonstrated that when these molecules accumulate in the liver of mammals, they cause certain enzymes to be produced. The bodies of the mammals then turn into veritable chemical processing plants. The enzymes alter chemicals, like pesticides or other contaminants, that have entered the system via the food chain. When the enzymes come into contact with the pollutants, they create a new group of highly toxic chemicals that are not found either in the environment or in laboratories. There is proof that these new chemicals cause cancer in some mammals. However, whether PCBs cause cancer in humans has not yet been proven. Out of the 565 million kilograms of PCBs produced in North America, 315 million are still in use. The remainder is either in storage or scattered in the environment. It is very difficult to get rid of PCBs. Ordinary incinerators won't destroy them. In fact, they provide just enough heat to transform them into byproducts that are even more toxic. When an atom of oxygen connects with the molecule of a PCB, it becomes a furan molecule. If two atoms of oxygen connect, the PCB molecule becomes a dioxin molecule. In humans, exposure to large quantities of furans and dioxins causes a skin eruption called chloracne. Also noted were digestive problems and muscle and joint pains. In animals, 
they have been proven to be cancer causing. Here again, there is no proof as yet that they cause cancer in humans. To destroy PCBs without creating furans or dioxins, they must be burned at temperatures of at least 1200 degrees Celsius. PCBs can only be broken down completely at that temperature, but the process is very costly. Researchers are trying to find a more economical way to dispose of PCBs. They have noticed some bacteria have a genetic heritage that enables them to degrade some of the 209 different PCB molecules. According to the researchers, several series of genes would be necessary for bacteria to be able to degrade all the types of PCBs. Since no such bacteria exists in nature, researchers are attempting to genetically engineer a super bacteria endowed with all the necessary genes. However, there's no telling what these man-made microorganisms might do. Their genetic instability could make them into ecological bombs even more devastating than the PCBs they are meant to destroy. What is happening with the PCBs is typical of our industrial societies. We never think about how we're going to get rid of dangerous substances and their waste. When an accident occurs, we turn to science, as if by a stroke of magic. It will solve all our problems. But by then, it's too late. The accidents have escalated into catastrophes. When we want to get rid of toxic waste, just about anything goes. In New York, for instance, major companies sold their toxic wastes to heating oil distributors. These small outfits mixed them with their oil to increase the quantities. They then sold them to consumers whose furnaces soon became sources of pollution themselves. In the 70s, we built plants with towering smokestacks that would spew the sulfurous gases high into the atmosphere. That just shifted the problem. It came back down to haunt us in the form of acid rain. In Canada, Scandinavia, and other industrialized countries, you can come across lakes that are limpid, devoid of algae. These lakes are crystalline because they have been completely stripped of their microorganisms, vegetation, and fish. They are dead lakes. Hundreds of lakes throughout the world have suffered the same fate. Their slow death is caused by the gradual acidification of their waters. The acidification is caused by sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxide emissions, which are spewed into the atmosphere. Nitrous oxide is a result of the burning of fossil fuels, motor vehicles being the worst culprits. But the greatest threat comes from sulfur dioxide, or SO2 emissions. The bulk of these emissions is sent into the atmosphere by coal-fired power stations. The smokestacks emitting sulfur dioxide can stand 300 meters tall, this keeps the immediate vicinity of the stations themselves relatively emission-free. However, prevailing winds carry the toxic emissions elsewhere. On the way, as it comes into contact with vapors and clouds, the sulfur dioxide undergoes a chemical transformation. The atom of sulfur and the SO2's two atoms of oxygen combine with the water's two atoms of hydrogen an atom of oxygen to become sulfuric acid. It's this acid that makes acid rain. But acidification is not only caused by acid rain. Considerable amounts of sulfur dioxide fall back to Earth before reacting chemically to the vapors of water. When these tiny particles of SO2 
touch dew. They undergo the same chemical change and become acid. The same acid that falls in the form of acid rain. Similar chemical reactions occur with nitrous oxide emissions from the motor vehicles on our roads. When a lake receives large quantities of acid rainfall, the metabolism of living creatures inhabiting the lake is severely affected. They cannot adapt to the acidity, cease to reproduce, and eventually die. The acidification has other consequences as well. When these acids filter into the ground, they cause a phenomenon called lixiviation. This is a process much like that which occurs in a filter coffee maker. The acidified water seeps through the soil, taking with it the minerals and substances vital to plant life. The soil is deprived of its nutrients, like coffee is of its flavor. Soils become unfit for growing trees. At present, whole forests are declining, probably irreversibly. Lixiviation also causes certain metals in the ground to dissolve. The trickling water causes large quantities of mercury and aluminum to filter into the lakes and waterways. The spreading of lime or limestone can temporarily offset the acidification of soils and lakes. But the effects are short term, neither practical nor economical. Acid rains don't spare man-made constructions either. Relentlessly, they are disfiguring our buildings, monuments, and sculptures. Acid deposits and rains are gradually eroding a number of areas of our globe. And yet, there is a solution. Strict anti-pollution standards. Everyone agrees, we must take action. The Swedes were the first to do something about acid rain. They established regulations for the burning of oil and coal. They implemented many programs encouraging industry to clean up their toxic gases. The results are convincing. Trout now swim in some of their lakes again. It will take international agreements to deal with pollution. As a rule, however, the study commission set up only groups some 20 industrialized countries. They commit themselves to, eventually, signing agreements to gradually reduce production of dangerous chemicals. All this takes time. Meanwhile, we continue to use products known to attack the ozone, and each day we destroy the Earth's natural protection a little more. Greenhouse effect, destruction of the ozone layer. Are we looking at another emergency situation? The chemicals polluting the planet's surface are threatening. But a much greater threat hovers a few kilometers above our heads. And it is endangering the survival of the entire biosphere. Since the beginning of the industrial era, man has gradually altered the composition of the gaseous layers that protect life on our globe. One of the major threats to the planet is the growing greenhouse effect, due in large part to the buildup of carbon dioxide emissions. Naturally present in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide shelters the planet like a gigantic sheet of glass. It lets the rays of the sun through during the day and traps the heat released from the ground at night. That is the greenhouse effect in its natural and beneficial state. Without its protective gas layer, the Earth's mean temperature would be 100 degrees Celsius in daytime and minus 150 at night. However, 
over the past hundred years, emissions of oil, gasoline, coal, natural gas, and wood have increased carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere by 30%. And it is estimated that it will double by the year 2030. The buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere magnifies the greenhouse effect and raises temperatures all over the planet. If carbon dioxide emissions maintain their current pace, the scientists predict a global warming of 3 to 5 degrees within 30 to 50 years. Consider that in 15,000 years, the temperature of the planet has only increased by 5 degrees. The length of time it took for that warming to occur meant that living creatures could adapt to the change. A similar warming over a period of merely 50 years would have a disastrous effect on the biosphere in its entirety. Whole regions of farmland could turn into deserts and grain production could drop by 50%. Melting glacier ice would raise water levels at least one meter, inundating low-lying coastal regions and cities. Rainfalls would be more abundant and an increase of only one degree would double the number of hurricanes. Another major problem confronting the world is the destruction of the ozone layer surrounding the Earth. The ozone layer is a natural veil of gas that prevents most of the sun's harmful ultraviolet rays from reaching the Earth. It acts like a sunscreen. Composed of three atoms of oxygen, ozone forms and destructs naturally in the stratosphere. The ozone layer is located between 15 and 50 kilometers above the Earth. At that altitude, pressure is 200 times lower than at the Earth's surface. As an indication of the ozone layer's fragility, it would be only three millimeters thick if it were brought down to the temperatures and pressure that prevail at the surface of the planet. But the chemicals used in aerosols, refrigerator coolants, insulating foams, and some containers made from such foams are gradually destroying that protective filter. They produce gases which belong to the family known as chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs and are seriously depleting the ozone layer. Unlike other substances, CFCs do not decompose in the lower layers of the atmosphere. They slowly climb up to the stratosphere. It is estimated that 90% of the CFCs released between 1955 and 1975 are still ascending toward the ozone layer. Once they reach to the stratosphere, CFCs are broken down by ultraviolet rays, which free atoms of chlorine. One single atom of chlorine can destroy up to 100,000 molecules of ozone. The destructive effect of CFCs was confirmed in 1985 by a meteorological satellite. A hole over the Antarctica was photographed, revealing a decrease of 40% of the ozone layer, and it is becoming thinner all around the globe. NASA statistics predict that if chlorofluorocarbon emissions go unchecked, up to 9% of the ozone layer could be destroyed within the next 50 years. The experts claim that the depletion of the ozone layer is already causing an increase in skin cancers. They even suspect that exposure to ultraviolet rays weakens the immune systems of animals and human beings. 
We know that ultraviolet rays can destroy microorganisms essential to ocean food chains, a cause for some concern for commercial fishing. The warming of the planet and the depletion of the ozone layer could have catastrophic effects on the balance of all our ecosystems. While human beings plan in the short term, Mother Nature reacts over the long term. Perhaps if we assessed the environmental losses in ecological dollars, the powers that be would move faster. The ozone layer is getting thinner. Species are vanishing. Our health is deteriorating. Put it all together, we're talking a lot of eco-dollars. We needn't panic, but we can no longer afford to be ignorant.